In this video, I want to talk about polynomial models and adding interaction variables to your regression model. Two very useful things to add to the analytics toolkit in order to make our regressions more reasonable reflections of reality. So I'll be working from the Polynomial Interactions RMD, link is in the description. And to start us off, let's review what we would like to see when we actually try to do a regression model. So I want to load up the CUS loyalty data set, and I want to look at the relationship between the lifetime value of a customer, the total amount of money that they've spent at a company, minus any sort of expenses required to keep them loyal customers, versus the total number of transactions that they've had at this company. Now, when we make a scatter plot, we see exactly what we'd like to see if we're interested in fitting a simple linear regression. The stream of points has a nice linear trajectory. The vertical spread is about the same everywhere. And we know that this is the playground for the simple linear regression model. Now, you might come across some relationships that have a bit of curvature in the stream of points, some amount of nonlinearity. For example, if we loaded up the bulldozer data set, and we looked at a model that was predicting the sale price of a bulldozer that was sold at auction, based on the year the bulldozer was made, well, what will we end up seeing? If we make a scatter plot, it looks like the stream of points might be taking a sharp curve upwards as we go to later and later year maids. It looks like there's a distinct nonlinearity in the trajectory of the stream of points, and adding the simple linear regression line kind of highlights that. We can see that the stream doesn't really follow the diagonal red line, indicating that there's some leftover curvature that's not quite captured by the model. If we were to look at the residuals plot, the diagnostic plots to see if the regression was a reasonable reflection of reality, we see that curvature in the residuals plot. And this is relatively common to see in business analytics. If we load up the auto data set and we study the relationship between the fuel efficiency of a car and its horsepower, well, we can detect a slight amount of nonlinearity in the stream of points, indicating that the assumptions of the regression model, that linearity assumption, doesn't seem to be holding. Now, previously, what we did to try to fix the regression model was to shift our perspective. We know that in business analytics, we have a choice as to what we're going to call our Y variable, and we have a choice as to what we'll call our X variable. They can be the originally recorded data values, or they can be a transformation of them. For instance, we might want to model the logarithm of the fuel efficiency versus the square root of the weight of a car. So with our example, with the sale price of the bulldozer, potentially we could do some sort of transformation of the sale price and the year made to come up with a better model. So if we fit that simple linear regression and run it through find transformations, we get a list of transformations that will improve the original model. And scrolling up all the way up to the top, we find that Find Transformations is suggesting let's model the square root of the sale price by a year made raised to the 1.75 power. That would be our y and our x variable. So how do we pull this off? Well, we define a new y variable to be the square root of the sale price. We define a new x variable to be the year made raised to the 1.75 power. And we fit our model with these transform variables. We can look at a summary of our model. We can look at the check regression output to see if there's any leftover curvature or unequal spread. And it looks like for the most part, the assumptions of the regression model hold fairly well, except for maybe the normality of the residuals, where we see this systematic bend at the left-hand side of the QQ plot. Now, another strategy that we can employ when we do see curvature in our stream of points is instead to fit a polynomial model in our predictor variable. So instead of predicting y from just x, we can predict it from x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. Every additional power of x can be an additional predictor in our regression model. So when we do see curvature, perhaps we'll have luck modeling the relationship with a polynomial of order m with our predictor variable x. The order of the polynomial is just simply the highest power that we're going to include that we're raising x2 in our model. And so the question would become, OK, well, what order polynomial do we need in order to capture the nonlinearities that we see in the relationship? So we have a function for this. Let's go back and refit the model predicting sale price from year made. We'll call it m.saleprice. And we're going to run this through the function choose order. 
So when we do this, we get a scatter plot that shows us the st original stream of points, the sale price versus year made, and we're shown six different polynomial models. The order one polynomial model is just the simple linear regression predicting the sale price from year made. Order two is from year made and year made squared. Order six, predicting sale price from year made, year made squared, to cubed, fourth, fifth, all the way up, and including the sixth power. So we have a rough guideline for what power of x, the order of the polynomial we should be choosing in order to best capture the curvature, and that is to look at the r squared adjusted of these regression models. Since we're adding multiple predictors in these models, we know we need to be comparing the r squared adjusted of the models, not the r squared themselves, because r squared is always going to get bigger whenever we add in a new predictor to the model, even if it's unrelated to our y variable. And so if we look at the output of choose order, what we find is that the r squared adjusted tends to increase as we get to higher and higher orders. And the power that has the highest r squared adjusted looks like order six, so predicting sale price from the year made, year made squared, all the way up through and including year made to the sixth power. But we do have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of how high of a power we want to include. Most things in nature don't really include things that go beyond, say, the fourth power in a relationship. So going to the fifth, going to the sixth power feels a little bit unnatural. Sometimes it's just what we need. But if we can get away with a lower power, generally that is what we would like to do. So my very rough guideline is to find the order associated with the highest r squared adjusted and subtract off 0 0.005. Any sort of polynomial model that has an r squared adjusted above this threshold, I'm going to say is acceptable. So if I subtract off 0 0.005 from that highest r squared adjusted, I get a value of 0.5762. So any polynomial model with an r squared adjusted above that value, I would say, represents a decent choice. So what we see is that the second order, the third order, all of the order polynomials, except for the very first, which was with that simple linear regression, looks like it's a reasonable choice. And so very often we go with the smallest order that we can get away with, the second order polynomial in this case, predicting sale price from year made and year made squared. But let's fine tune this decision by looking at the scatter plot and what these models do for us. If we look at the second and third order polynomials, we have the green and the red line. They're somewhat overlapping, but notice the way that this model is shaped, we have this weird uptick as we go to year maids that are farther and farther back in time. And that feels a bit unnatural. I would expect the older the bulldozer, the less it should be selling for. And so I might actually just eliminate the order two and order three polynomials from consideration because I don't like that upward bend, implying that at some point, even older bulldozers are gonna be selling for more. So I would probably actually go with this fourth order of polynomial here. The fourth, fifth, and sixth seem to be having the right behavior where they continue that downward trajectory as we go towards older and older bulldozers. So I might say, okay, let's choose a fourth order polynomial in order to study the relationship. So once we've done that, how do we actually fit the model? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run LM once again, what we always use to fit a regression model. And we're going to fit sale price, predict sale price here, from the command poly, and then we'll give it the predictor here, the year made, and then the order that we want to use in our model, data equals bulldozer. And so what this will do is it will automatically say, okay, well, I will go and create year made as a predictor, year made squared as a predictor, cubed as a predictor, and fourth to power as a predictor as well. And so when we do fit a polynomial, we do include all powers of x up through the first power, second power, third power, up to whatever order that we've chosen. We don't throw away like the third power or second power and just keep the fourth. Model hierarchy is a concept that guides us on what terms we want to be including in the model. And model hierarchy says that if we want to have a fourth order polynomial be our model, we're going to include the second and third powers, even if they're not statistically significant in the model. That's just what we do. So we can check to see, hey, are we doing any better once we do this polynomial model? Have we solved the curvature in the residuals? Well, what we could do is we can go and check the regression once we fit that model. And once we've done that, if we give it just a little bit more room, 
we can see that there's no leftover curvature now in that residuals plot. The QQ plot of the residuals looks better. There's still a little bit of wiggling, I would say, in the QQ plot. The stream of points is going up and below the diagonal red line. So maybe some small issues with normality, but relatively small. We're in a much better place than where we originally started. So with multiple predictors, sometimes the best way to determine if you really do need polynomial terms is to look at the residuals plot to see if there is any sort of leftover curvature between the residuals and the values of your predictor variable. So let's go and actually predict sale price from all of the predictors in our bulldozer data frame. And we'll run the check regression command adding the extra equals true so that we get a plot of the residuals versus the values of the predictor variables themselves. Now, when we do this, what we'll find is if we scroll through to the residual versus predictor plots, we find that the residuals versus year made definitely still has this U-shaped curvature indicating that even after we've accounted for the bulldozer's usage, its blade, its tire size, how long ago that auction actually occurred, we still see some nonlinearity in the relationship between the sale price and the year made. So that would be an indicator that yes, we do need to put in a polynomial term with year made in order to better study the relationship. Now, if we do detect this in the residuals plot, one thing we can do to choose the appropriate order of the polynomial is actually try to predict the size of the residual from that predictor variable itself. So we could extract out the residuals of our model, call it y dot residuals, extract out the value of the predictor variable, so extract out the year made, call it x dot year made, and then fit a model trying to predict the size of the residual from our predictor variable itself. Once we do that and we run the choose order, it's going to allow us some sort of guidance in figuring out, well, what's the appropriate order for year made that we should be choosing? And so once again, we can find the order that has the highest R squared, in this case, subtract off 0 0.005, and any order that has an R squared adjusted bigger than 0 0.07396 is reasonable for us to choose for the final order of our model. So which ones actually include that? Well, really the first one, the lowest order that we find is that fourth order polynomial that we were tempted to use before. So it looks like actually taking year made, raising it to the fourth power and including the third power, the second power, and just year made by itself are gonna be worthwhile additions to the regression model. So let's do that. How would we fit this model with everything? I'll call it m dot all. I'll left arrow that to be the sale price being predicted from everything, twiddle dot. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract out the year made and then add in the polynomial term in year made. So we'll say poly year made comma four, and this is living in the bulldozer data here. And so when we run this, we can get a summary of our regression model. We have all of the terms, years ago, usage, blade, tire size, then the four terms that involve the sale price. And we can see, okay, well, how well is our model doing at making predictions? So we see typically our sale price is off by about $21,000 from the predicted value. The R squared adjusted is all the way up at 0.6184. Now notice how much better this R squared adjusted is than if we had not done a polynomial term in year made. If we had just done sale price twiddle dot and looked at the regression summary, that R squared adjusted would have been all the way down at 0.578. So we've vastly improved the predictive power of our model, the ability to explain the relationship by including a fourth order polynomial in the year made. So fitting a polynomial model is a great way to add some extra flexibility to your regression model and to capture those nonlinearities that you might see in the relationships. Now, another cool thing that we can add to a regression model that can potentially make it an even more reasonable reflection of reality is to be adding interaction terms between our predictor variables. Now, I need to explain what that is, and this is best done within an example. So let's imagine that we're working in retail analytics and we want to be studying the total sales of a product based on the price of that product and the amount by which it's discounted. 
So I'm going to generate some data along those lines, and let's go ahead and fit a model that predicts the sales based on the base price and the discount. We run it through visualize model because there are two predictor variables. We actually get two different plots that break down what does the relationship look like according to the model between sales and each of our predictors. And let's go ahead and focus in on the one on the right. So what we have here is the relationship according to the model between sales and discount, and that's broken down by the base price of the product, small, medium, and large. And what we see is that these three lines are parallel to one another. In other words, the strength of the relationship between sales and discount is independent of the base price of the item we're looking at. Items that are more deeply discounted tend to have larger sales. Now, another way to think about this is to focus in on the difference in the number of sales between cheap products and expensive products that are discounted by the same amount. So when we have a model with no interactions, the model is assuming that this difference is a constant. If we focus in on items that are full price, $0 off, we're going to observe some difference in sales between cheap and expensive products. And this size of the difference is going to persist regardless of the dollar amount discounted. So if we compare products that are discounted $5, we're going to see that exact same difference in sales between cheap and expensive products. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really the way the real world works? And I don't think it is, because the way that consumers work is that they seem to be highly motivated by deep percentage discounts. So if we have a customer walking by a product that normally is priced $10 and they see that it's $5 off, well, that's a 50% discount and that's going to feel like a lot to them. And that's going to drive sales really quite a lot. Now, on the other hand, if we go and look at a $500 product, a customer walking by, seeing a $5 off promotion isn't going to be all that impressed because that is only 1% off. So Shania Twain is helping us out. When we see a $5 off a $500 product, that don't impress me. So the model without the interactions is somewhat limiting. It's not really reflecting the real world because it's assuming that the difference in sales between cheap and expensive products is going to be the same regardless of how they're discounted. And that just doesn't fly in the face of intuition correctly. So what we can do to get a more reasonable reflection of reality is to add in an interaction term between the base price of the item and the discount applied to that item. And we can add in that interaction term by multiplying our two predictor variables. Now, when we do this and when we look at the results of visualized model, we capture what we know is true about the way that customers behave. If we go and focus in on products that are full price, the discount is $0, we observe some difference in sales between cheap products and expensive products. But as we move into higher discounts, like $5 off, what we find is that this difference in sales between cheap products and expensive products grows. From $5 off to $10 off, that difference in sales continues to grow. And that's reflective of how customers really work, because for cheap products, the larger the discount, that percentage off is just accelerating. It's really driving the sales to a great degree. But if we're looking at those $500 products, well, $1 off, $5 off, $10 off. To customers, that's going to feel about the same because it's not a huge percentage increase in the percent discount. So it's not going to drive sales as strongly. So by adding in that interaction, we're allowing that difference in sales between cheap and expensive products that are discounted by that same amount to grow as the dollar discount grows. And it's also allowing the strength of the relationship between sales and discount to vary based on the base price of the product. So cheap products are driven more by further dollar discounts than more expensive products. So adding that interaction really helped out our model. And we can see that it is statistically significant in the model itself. So we know that adding in that interaction is going to better reflect reality and it more captures the way that customers really behave in the real world. And very often, this is what we need to incorporate into a model to come up with a most reasonable reflection of reality. So let's revisit the salary data set where we try to predict someone's monthly salary based on the number of years of experience they had at the time of hire and the number of years of education they had at the time of hire. If we look at a summary of this, well, we could interpret the coefficient of, say, education. 
So we would say that two employees with the same number of years of experience under their belt that differ in education by one year are expected to differ in their monthly salaries by about $90, with the more educated employee having the higher salary. Now, we might ask ourselves, now, wait a minute, might the relationship between salary and education be different depending on what level of experience we have when we're considering these employees? I could make the argument that, hey, if someone's coming in to the company with 20 years of previous experience, it probably doesn't matter all that much what their educational level is. They're going to know how to do that job. Likewise, if we're dealing with someone that has a lot of education potentially, well, if you have a lot of education, you might not have all that much experience, but the fact that you're super highly educated might actually garner you a fairly high salary. It might not matter if you have zero, one, two, three years of experience. If you're coming into the job with a tremendous amount of education, well, that effect might just outweigh and make irrelevant the amount of experience you have. So let's try to incorporate an interaction between experience and education in our model here. So the way that we can fit this in R is by predicting salary just from the product of experience and education. R will go and actually put in experience and education as individual predictors, and it'll also put the product of those two variables in the model. So if we fit it and look at a summary, we have the predictor experience. We have the predictor education. We have the predictor education times experience. It is statistically significant. So adding that interaction into the model that already has education and experience by itself does provide a statistically significant reduction in sum of squared errors. So the addition of this predictor, this interaction, looks worth it. So what are the implications of this? Well, if we visualize the model here, I think the implications become pretty intuitive. So if we do look at the relationship between the salary and the education of an employee, we see the strength of this relationship is tied in to the amount of experience that the employee has. If we look at someone that doesn't have all that much experience, well, education has a really large effect on the salary of the individual. The slope is the steepest among all levels of experience here. Now, as we move into individuals that have more experience, mid-range levels of experience, there's still a fairly steep relationship between salary and education, but it's not quite as steep, not quite as strong as when someone had really no experience whatsoever. And as we continue this, as we consider individuals with more and more experience up until the largest values that we see in the data set, we see from the red line that if someone comes into the job with a tremendous amount of experience, the effect of education all but disappears. We see that the slope of the line is still very, very slightly positive, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like you get paid the same amount regardless of your educational level if you come into the uh, uh, company with a ton of experience. And likewise, if we look at the relationship between salary and experience, we find that it's a very, very steep relationship. If someone doesn't have all that much education, the more experience you have, the higher your salary, and that has a really large effect coming into it with very little education. But if you have a lot of education close towards the largest values in the data set, we actually find that too much education, the implication is from the model, that actually works against you a little bit. The slope of the relationship between salary and experience actually looks to be a little bit negative at the highest educational levels. So another way to look at this interaction between education and experience is to kind of look at how big of a variation we see in salaries at different experience levels. So if we go and hone in at someone with zero years of education, we see that there's a really big variation in the salary based on experience. With very little experience, of course, you're getting paid the least. With a very large amount of experience, you're getting paid the most. But there's a big variation in terms of what that salary is based on your experience level. Now, as we increase the educational level of someone, and we look, let's say, at an education of around six, we see that that difference in salaries based on experience all but disappears. When we have an education right at around six years, the red line, the black line, the blue line all converge, indicating that now experience really doesn't matter. If you have six years of education coming into it, it doesn't matter if you had zero years of experience, 20 years of experience, the model is saying that you can expect to get paid the exact same amount. Now we can also see what adding an interaction term does for us by studying the regression equations. And I think this is a really productive way to look at this because we can see explicitly exactly what the regression equation is doing. 
So if we fit our model with the interaction and get a summary, we can transcribe the regression equation. So taking the coefficients and the predictor variables, here's what our equation is relating salary to education and experience. Now let's rewrite this equation by grouping a couple of terms. I'm interested to see, well, what does the relationship between salary and education itself look like? Well, why don't we head and group together these two terms that both involve education? We'll take out that common factor of education and then add the other parts together. And what we would find is that our equation looks as follows. That salary is 2841 plus 38.2 times experience plus a coefficient now that varies based on the educational level of the individual. So we see very clearly that when we have an interaction term in the model, the coefficient of one of those predictor variables isn't a constant, but it actually varies depending on the value of the other variable in that interaction. So if I were to go in and actually plug in, what if someone has zero experience, replacing zero for experience in those equations, I would find that my equation is salary is just 28041 plus 149.5 times education. So two individuals that differ in education by one year and that have zero experience are expected to differ in salary by $149.5. Now, if instead I want to compare people with 20 years of experience, I can plug in 20 to my regression, regression equation. And once I go through the math, I would find that salary is equal to 3605 plus 25.5 times education. So now when I'm comparing people with a lot of experience and they differ in terms of education by one year, I now only expect them to differ in salary by $25.5 versus that $149.5 when they had zero experience going into the job. And so that's the power of adding in this interaction term. We know that in the real world, the strength of relationships might vary depending on the characteristics of our individuals. And putting in the product of two particular predictor variables in our regression model allows them to have an interaction, and it allows the strength of the relation between Y and one of those predictors to vary based on the other. So how do we know when we need to put in an interaction or when we can leave it out? And the short answer is we don't. Very often we audition different models and see what ends up working the best. And so very often we just like to include interactions to see if it's worthwhile to actually have them in the model. So for example, if we load up the tips data set and we fit a model that predicts the tip percentage left on a bill based on the bill amount, the party size, and the interaction between those two, we can gauge whether or not an interaction seems to be important to include in the model by looking at the output of visualize model. So my quick rule is that if we see the lines being nearly parallel, we do not need an interaction because the strength of that relationship is basically the same regardless of the values of that other variable. If we do see those lines cross, or if we do see those lines have very different slopes, well, that would indicate that an interaction might be necessary to come up with the most reasonable reflection of reality. And whenever you run the visualized model, it'll let you know from a statistical point of view, is that interaction term statistically significant? And if it is, you should probably include that in the model. So with this interaction between bill and party size, what have we learned? Well, looking at the far right plot, looking at that relationship between tip percentage and party size according to the model, what we find is that the red line, which corresponds to very large bills, the bigger the party size, the higher the tip percentage. But that relationship is reversed if we go and look at small bills. If we look at small bills that are being um, spent by parties, and these parties increase in size from one to two to three, et cetera, we actually find that there's a negative relationship between tip percentage and party size when we have relatively small bills. So that's the implication of the model. The relationship between tip percentage and party size is not a constant. It depends on what size of bill we're talking about. Another example, we can look at the amount of profit that a newly released product has actually earned a couple of weeks after release. If we load up the launch data set, one way to very quickly fit in a whole bunch of interactions into the model is to put inside parentheses, separated by plus signs, all of the predictors that you want the two-way interactions. So here, if I wrap x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 in parentheses, and then raise that to the second power, what that's going to do is it's going to predict profit from x1, x2, x3, and x4, and then also all two-way interactions. 
x1 times x2, x1 times x3, x3 times x4, so on and so forth. Note that it doesn't actually include x1 squared, x2 squared, etc. The squared part is to actually put in the interactions. Poly is what you need in order to put in a polynomial model with powers here. So let's predict profit from these four anonymized variables. So this might be the advertising on the internet, on radio, on TV, and newspaper. And then we can get a summary of the model to see what all of our coefficients are. Some of these interactions look to be statistically significant. And if we have a lot of interactions in our model, well, C interactions is the command we're going to use instead. So when we do C interactions, what this does is it goes through each pairwise interaction, and it gives us our interaction plots. And so when we see lines that are roughly parallel to one another, we don't expect the interaction to play an important role. We wouldn't need to include it in the model itself. When we do see the lines have very different slopes, that's indicating that, oh, well, the strength of the relationship between y and this predictor is tied into the value of this other predictor variable. So is there an interaction between x1 and x2 based on these interaction plots? Well, kind of. We see on the far right plot that the relationship between profit and x2 is fairly steep when x1 is large, but not quite as steep when x1 is small. So a small variation in slope, depending on what the value of x1 is. Slight evidence of an interaction. It does not look like there's an interaction between x1 and x4, though, because the three regression lines that, that are being presented look roughly parallel to one another. So the strength of the relationship between profit and x1, it has the same strength regardless of if x4 is small, medium, or large. And then finally, going back to the bulldozer data set, what if we fit two-way interactions between all possible predictor variables? Well, we have a shortcut for that. We can do sale price twiddle dot squared. That'll use all the original predictors and then all two-way interactions. So if we do this, what sort of interactions might look to be important in the bulldozer data set? Well, it doesn't look like there's an interaction between the year made of the bulldozer and the number of years ago this auction took place because our three regression lines look to be roughly parallel. The strength of these relationships between sale price and years ago or sales price and year made are the same strength regardless of the value of that other variable. Maybe a small interaction between year made and usage because I can detect a little bit of a difference in the slopes between the relationship between sale price and usage, a much steeper slope here on the solid uh, line, and a much shallower slope, less slope, with the dotted line. So maybe a small interaction there. Here's evidence of a fairly large interaction, an interaction between the year in which the bulldozer was made and the tire size. So what we find is that when the year made is relatively small, so for really old bulldozers, it looks like there's a fairly strong positive relationship between sale price and tire size. But if we look at more new bulldozers where year made is large, what we find is that this relationship is now negative. Bulldozers with larger tires tend to sell for actually a little bit less. So there you have it, two additional ways to add in a tremendous amount of additional flexibility to our regression models. Polynomial models allow us to model curvature, nonlinearities in our relationships, and interaction variables allow us to model the possibility that the strength of the relationship between a y variable and an x variable isn't always the same for all individuals. The strength of that might vary based on the values of that individual's characteristics.